Hello dear students, we are going to see the second part of today's presentation on uh, Lord Byron. Lord Byron, he was actually born as George Gordon Byron. He was the sixth uh, Baron Byron. He was born on January the 2nd, uh, 1788 in London, England and died on April 19th, 1824. You can see he died fairly young. He died in Greece. He was a British romantic poet and a satirist whose poetry and personality captured the imagination of Europe, and I'm going to tell you why. Besides being a very handsome man, because he was the son of the handsome and pro profligate uh, Captain John Mad Jack Byron and his second wife Catherine Gordon, uh, a Scots heiress, <coughs> in 1798 at the age of 10, he unexpectedly inherited the title and estates of his great uncle William V, Baron Byron. His mother, of course, proudly, swiftly took him back to England, where the boy fell in love with the ghostly halls and spacious ruins of Newstead Abbey, which was the, homes, the home of the Byrons. In 1805, he entered Trinity College in Cambridge, where he piled debts at an alarming rate and indulged in the conventional vices of undergraduates. He started to show incipient sexual ambivalence, uh, which became much more pronounced in time. Um, in his adult years, when he reached majority in 1809, he took his seat in the House of Lords and then embarked with the Hope House on a grand tour. Hope House was a friend of his. Uh, they sailed to Lisbon, crossed Spain, and proceeded to Gibraltar and Malta to Greece, where they ventured inland to uh, Ioannina and to Tepelele in um, Albania. Now, seeking to escape his love affairs in marriage, Byron proposed in September 18, uh, 1814 uh, to Anne Isabella Milbank. Uh, they got married on January 1815 and Lady Byron gave birth to a daughter, uh, Augusta Ada, in December 1815. The, the, the marriage was doomed to failure ever since the beginning um, because, well, Byron's wife was ima unimaginative, humorless, and he was not and therefore in 1816 just a year later after the birth of Auguste uh, no, just a few months later Annabella left Byron she went to live with her parents amid uh, swirling rumors centering on his relations with Auguste League another lady of the court and his bisexuality so what he said about Lord Byron is that he had many love affairs throughout his life. Many of those were, le were with married women and others that he met in his journeys. He also is said to have uh, male lovers. So he enjoyed both men and women. And he was also a great poet and, of course, a grand personality of the time, not only for being such a handsome man, but also for his uh, personality, rebellious personality against the standards of his time. So we're going to be looking into She Walks in Beauty, but uh, before that we will continue to analyze Out to the West Wind from the previous presentation and um, the last presentation, which is uh, the last poem, which is She Walks in Beauty by Lord Byron. So continuing with our presentation today, we're going to see um, a brief analysis in regards to uh, Ode to the West Wind by Percy Shelley. So what does this poem illustrate? It illustrates the most powerful impact of a specific type of wind, uh, the, the West Wind. And it also exhibits the poet's desire to utilize the mighty west wind as a medium to make people realize the importance 
of this natural blessing. Um, a representative of power, the poem manifests two important points, the power of the west wind and the power of poetry. He calls the wind preserver, destructor, wild, muse, musician, and an agent of change. He also asks the wind to transform him into a musical instrument so that he can play the tune of his thoughts and ideas to make the world aware of his presence. He adds the powerful west wind also brings winter with it that symbolizes death but he's hopeful about the spring that will bring new life after winter. Some literary devices that we're going to find in this poem. <clears throat> uh, the first one being alliteration, which is the repetition of consonant, uh, consonant sounds in the same line, such as the, the sound W in O wild west wind thou breath of autumn's being. We also have the simile, which is a figure of speech used to compare an object or a person with something else. For example, are driven like ghosts from a chant of fleeing. Okay, the comparison, like the, the leaves are driven, taken away like ghosts from an chant of fleeing. This is the simile, a comparison. Uh, we also have symbolism. He uses symbolism to signify ideas and qualities, giving them symbolic meanings different from literal meanings. For example, the west wind symbolizing the mighty power of nature. Then we also have imagery, which is used to make the readers perceive things with their five senses, like for example, the dark wintry bed, the trumpet of a prophecy. Mm -hmm. um, we discussed this in the previous video as to how he uses imagery. Some other devices, personification. He uses personification to give human qualities to inanimate objects, for example, calling the wind destroyer and preserver. Uh, and also the anastrophe. Uh, I also mentioned it in the past video. It refers to the reversal of the syntactically correct order of subjects, verbs, and objects in a sentence, saying leaves dead instead of the dead leaves. Um, and some others, as we mentioned, the stanza, which is a poetic form of some, uh, some lines. The poem is divided into five cantos. It's a long poem. It has 23 stanzas in it, and there are four tercets in each canto, in one couplet, okay? Uh, it is composed as in a terza rima, which uh, was created by Dante Alighieri for the Divine Comedy. Um, it is a three-line stanza in which the first and the last line are going to rhyme, and is written in iambic pentameter, which is a type of meter having five iams in it, ten syllables in each line. The IAM is a literary device that can be defined as a foot containing unaccented and short syllables, followed by long and accented syllable in a single poem, unstressed and stressed syllables. The wing seeds were they like cold and low. Okay? It is somehow making an emphasis to to rhyme. Okay. I'm going to ask you, as part of your exercise, to uh, create some, to bring some examples, okay? This is for the class, but I'm going to ask you to do it in the forum, to identify some, uh, at least one line of imagery, one of personification, uh, one of simile, alliteration, symbolism, and an astrophe present in this poem, okay? Post it in the forum, please. Now. We're going to talk about She Walks in Beauty, which is the other poem by Lord Byron that we're going to have a look in this class. She Walks in Beauty is a beautiful lyrical poem that focuses on female beauty and explores the idea that physical appearance depends upon inner goodness and, if in harmony, can result in the romantic ideal of aesthetic perfection. 
It is often labeled as a love poem, but there's no direct mention of love, no suggestion of romance between the speaker and the subject. Clearly, it shows deep affection and even the artist's admiration for a female figure who is perhaps more of a symbol of purity and innocence than a love interest of the poet. Okay? So, let us work on She Walks in Beauty. Please open your books in uh, file number 6, Romantic Age, page 855. She Walks in Beauty like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies and all that's best of dark and bright meet in her aspect and her eyes thus mellow to that tender light which heaven to god it day denies one shade the more one ray the less had half impaired the nameless grace which waves in every raven tress or softly lightens over her face where thoughts serenely sweet express how pure, how dear their dwelling place. And on that cheek, and over that brow, so soft, so calm, yet eloquent, the smiles that win, the tints that glow, but tell of days in goodness spent, a mind at peace with all below, a heart whose love is innocent. I would like you to tell me and read this poem on your own, and tell me what kind of woman is Byron describing? Is it merely a beautiful woman? Is it uh, is he admiring merely the external beauty of the person, of the woman that he is describing, or is perhaps the the poet admiring something else about this lady? What kind of attributes? What kind of qualities? does he see in this beautiful lady tell me in the forum and also use the forum to discover some of the literary devices that lord byron has used in order to create um this lovely poem uh, the ones we have already talked about simile uh imagery anastrophe uh, alliteration and so on okay the ones that we have been discussing let me know how many you can find and put it also in uh, in the forum okay i hope you have enjoyed this presentation this is uh, she walks in beauty from lord byron probably one of the most beautiful poems ever written about a woman's beauty mm -hmm. okay Thank you for your attention and I hope to see you in the forums. Thank you.